how the style of Uber is so different now from Kant. It's not very philosophical, <laughs> quote unquote. Um, and again, let's remember that philosophy comes in many shapes and sizes, like people right there. And this is the tragedy, I think, of the way philosophy starts here in, in the Western world. We only think something is philosophical if it's like, you know, this argument and that argument. We don't see that there are other ways to, ex to express a philosophical idea, for example, through a story or through a dialogue like Plato does, right? Um, people like Sartre and Camus are gonna write novels, <laughs> philosophical novels, right? In the ancient world, legends, myths were all containing philosophical ideas, right? So we've reduced philosophy, that's what we do best, right? I think Nietzsche says that. We make everything into a corpse, right? That's <laughs> basically his criticism of, of Western science and Western thought, right? It makes everything into a corpse. So we've reduced philosophy to this kind of analytic, you know, it has to be, you know, be convincing and argumentative. And, and really there's millions of ways in the past that philosophy has been um, taught. So Buber here is using, uh, one of you, the person who criticized him was writes poetry. So does anybody know, it's really poetic language. You really, you can't just read it and be like, um, you know what, it, it's, it's really, he's, 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 he's speaking in poetry. And so my first question to you guys is, why do you think he uses poetry to talk about what he's talking about? Do you remember what he's talking about? And why does he think that poetry is the only way to really express it correctly? Um, why do we sometimes use poetry instead of prose? You could ask yourselves, <laughs> right? Um, when you're when, huh? instead of war? Prose. Like for example, you're in love with someone, you're not gonna be like, I love you very much, and I think that we should, well, some of you are, but <laughs> you know, you're gonna try and be kind of poetic, right? You're gonna try, why? Why is it at a certain moment we feel that only poetry is gonna do it and prose is not enough? Or you can convince the person to love you and to be like, you know, I think we should be together because X, Y, and Z, that would be the nice philosophical treatise approach, right? Is that gonna work? No. So <laughs> you wanna probably use poetry. Why would you use poetry? What do you, what, how is poetry gonna be better than the argumentative approach when it comes to trying to get, trying to woo someone. <laughs> then we can look why Buber writes in philosophy and poetry. So, so you wanna, you wanna seduce someone. Are you gonna do an argument why they should be with you? <laughs> Some of us do that. I've done that. <laughs> I admit it. <laughs> I'm really good, like convincing. Like, Look, this, this, and this, this is why didn't work. <laughs> the man fled. <laughs> you know, it's the best way to make the person flee. So, why is it that poetry is better for these situations than analytic, argumentative approach? Yes, we can. Okay, very good, right? When you talk about certain things, language, just, you know, plain language, right? It's not gonna work. Like if you just tell the person, I love you because I think that 
uh, you're beautiful. Okay, that might work, but if you say something like, you know, you are like a rose in the morning, I don't know, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a little different effect, right? So when you're trying to express, remember, we are in two dimensions. This is the, I, philosophers all take for granted that we are dual, we have dual citizenship. All of them, from Plato to Kant, do that, right? We are partly in the material realm, partly there is the metaphysical, immaterial realm that we are trying as philosophers to explore. That's really what we're doing. I don't believe philosophy is about talking about facts, right? Uh, it's not science, it's not history. It's talking about the metaphysical realm to which we belong and philosophers often struggle obviously to talk about it. We saw Kant had to make up words, right? <laughs> in order to talk about it, noumenal, phenomenal. This isn't German, right? So it's Greek. So. So likewise, right, Buber is trying to express something which is very, which is mysterious, which is ungraspable, which is the relationship with uh, the deeper part of the human being, right? We are relating to them, not because they're fun to be with, or they give us this and we give them that, right? On the instinctual level, to use Kant's level, we are relating on a deeper level, which is hard to put in words. So Buber has to break into song, right? Into poetry in order to begin to... Uh, open up this dimension to us, right? Which is not a dimension that words can really approach. Um, did you want to say something? Yeah, yeah I was just going to say, like, I think with Kyle, it was the same thing that we're, um, he wasn't really trying to persuade you to believe some certain way. It was sort of just to suggest something and then, you know, you take it from there. Exactly, right? We have to take the journey, right? This is often the case with especially existentialist philosophy like Buber and, and Levinas. If you haven't experienced it, you're not going to understand it. You have, it's an, it, most of these philosophies are invitations. They're not proofs, right? Even Kant, right? It's an invitation to explore this realm, right? They're, you cannot prove these realms. It's not like I can come and put it in front of you, right? You can only give a glimpse of it as philosophers, and then it's an invitation for us to explore, right? So most of these philosophies are going to just cut to, they're going to just not even try to argue, they're gonna to try to reveal. That's phenomenology. Phenomenology, in a nutshell, is I'm not gonna argue with you, I'm gonna reveal. I'm gonna open up this dimension, and then if you wanna know if it really exists, you have to enter yourself, right? Okay, so, um, so that's just in response to the language, right? Why he's writing like this. And also, we will see that this realm, this is why also poetry is only approached subjectively there, and this is really interesting. I, I like this with existentialist philosophy. There is a truth which can only be approached by the individual subject. It's not available like a universal object. Like all of us can see there is a book, but all of us will, each one of us will understand it differently. You see, there is some truth, there is some knowledge that is only accessible to the individual. And every individual is going to see it different. This is, by the way, just to open a parenthesis, the genius of uh, teachers, masters who, who teach in parables, right? Like some of the Hasidic masters of Uber, so like Jesus, for example, taught in parables. Why? Because each person can look at the parable, and a parable, by the way, is a story, right? Each person can look at the parable and gain something profoundly, like be hit by a lesson that's just for them, right? So that's also one of the uh, benefits of poetry, each one of us is going to read it and be affected differently. We're going to be moved differently because he's trying to awaken each one of us to this deeper experience. And so he wants each one of us to be hit, awakened differently. That's why poetry, right? If he makes it universal, we're just going to be like, you know, reading a script. But this is something that we have to be kind of awakened to. So the poetry is there to kind of awaken something within us so that we can open up to this dimension, right? That's what poetry does, right? If you, um, poetry really, the, the beauty of it, uh, I was reading, I was, I was mentoring a, a friend of mine, she's trying to write application, right? Application letter, right? And she was trying to be like, just putting the list of all her achievements. I was like, please don't do that, that's boring. Um, and so I told her like, tell me a little bit, your, your story, your, your intellectual journey. She said, well, when I was 12, I used to skip school a lot. I'm like, there, that's where you start with. <laughs> you start with that sentence. When I was 12, I used to skip school. And then you go into, right? So this is a way of speaking, which is more um, imaged. It's more autobiographical. It's not just that, 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 right? It will, it hits the reader differently to see something poetic than to read a list <laughs> or an argument. Um, if you're just uh, arguing, 
the person will be convinced intellectually, but they won't be moved in their deeper being. And Gruber wants to move us in our deeper being. That's why he's going to pull at the cords of our heart. Do you follow what I'm saying? Right? So Gruber is not trying to, to convince us. He's trying to transform us. He's trying to move us. He's trying to awaken us. And that's why he uses poetry. Only poetry moves us in a deeper way than just the head, right? Okay. So it's, he's starting with a really beautiful quote, and he's alluding here to the Hebrew Bible. So we'll spend a little time on that. And those who are familiar, how many of you are familiar with the book of Genesis in the Hebrew Bible and read parts of it? One, two, uh, three, few. Okay, so good. So then you will help me on that because he's alluding to it. Uh, go to page 69. The, under the star, you have one line. In the beginning is the relation. Okay, those of you who know the Hebrew Bible, in the beginning, immediately, something should come up in your head. He's quoting, he's alluding to it strongly, and we have to understand what he's alluding to, to understand everything else he's gonna say. In the beginning, where is this? Yes. The first word of the creation story. Very good, right? First word of the Hebrew Bible, creation story. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? That's the verse he's looking at. Now, he's shifting it. In the beginning is the relation. So I want to stop on that because this is actually a very profound moment. This is a moment where we have to go into some of the mystical Judaism to understand what he's doing that. So we're going to take a little trip today, a little field trip to uh, the, the mystics of the Jewish tradition because there are some really interesting things that are contained, packed into this sentence, right? So first of all, in the beginning. In the Hebrew, I'm going to type that word. Is it on my screen? No. <laughs> okay. The Reshit, Um, So we're going to be doing a little bit of uh, Jewish mysticism. The Jewish uh, writers uh, used to um, not only try to interpret sentences and the meaning of the sentences, but they would look at different letters and interpret the meanings. The Hebrew language is a little bit like Chinese. If you're familiar with the Chinese language, it's very visual. The, the, the letters tell stories, right? <laughs> Do you know a little bit of Chinese? So if you have like, tell, give us an example. Draw us a, a Chinese character and tell us a story that is contained in that character. Show us. Uh... Go, 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 go. <laughs> I'm not like, you know, because I was born here, so I, my Chinese like writing is like very like... Our Chinese and, sucks completely, so we won't be able to tell. Do you have any word you, you remember, a letter that you can then, you can tell us if there is some story in it? I know there's a story, but it just looks... Or the visuals, there's some visuals in it, which can explain the letter. Uh, be courageous. Let me just make you sure can it's correct. If you're going <laughs> to Google it, really? <laughs> Maybe, I'm just going to... Uh -huh. Do you know Chinese too? No, you're not from, you're from the Nepal, Tibet. Yeah. Which one, Nepal? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. No other Chinese among us? No. Okay. I mean, show us, I don't show think us. It, it, it really indicates any story though. It's show just... <laughs> Sometimes they have, um, I remember one word for garden. Yes, here you go. One word for garden, but I'm, I'm just in that case, so I'll let you, oh, it's great. I know there's one in there. That's like the beginning character for potato. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, um, you know, soil and water. And oh, there you go. So, Where is this soil? I mean, there's not that's what I mean. It's just, it oh, just that's looks great. like a cross. That's like, a potato. No, but we see the soil like and the potato coming up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I see it. <laughs> Potatoes don't come up though, so I don't know. <laughs> you get the idea. He's doing a very poorly, poor job right now. <laughs> but a lot of Chinese characters, right? They have. You, you see what I'm saying? Are you getting? Are you have a question? You see what, what I'm saying? It's the same in Hebrew, right? The letters actually also used to tell a story, right? And the first letter. Now going back to the Hebrew, the first letter of Genesis is the Hebrew. I'm not even sure if I'm spelling it right. Am I right, guys? Yes. There's an olive in between. Finish. Finish. Here? Yeah. Finish. Finish. Okay. This is the first. So this is 
Hebrew tips. Look at this letter bit. Is that a Hebrew tip? Is that first letter? I always rely on my... It's been years that me and Goldstein are in class and I'm asking her for Hebrew tips. <laughs> Look at this letter bit, right? What do you notice about it? There's a whole story there. What, what does it make you feel like, first of all, the bit? What, what are some of the emotions? What, what does it look like? Wait, is it in the, in the box or outside? Yeah, in the box. In, in the, the box. box. That's the bit. That, that. Flag. What? Like a flag. <laughs> An axe. There, there is the bit. Oh, okay. Right? In the actual... Okay. What like a it? hangman without the mom? No, no, no. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> what do you think? First of all, wear the clothes open. Try to see it in this way. If you were a tiny person, right? What would best be for you? A tunnel? Almost. Tiny person, yes. Does it come out the brown? Yes, it's on the ground, so there's a sta stable element, sure, but then there's this kind of thing there. Yes, like you're getting the idea. So the tree, cliff? if you go under it, how do you feel? Trap. Trap. And close. And close, thank you. You see where I'm trying to go. <laughs> <laughs> the bed is protected, right? It has all three sides are closed, and then you have this opening where you can come and kind of nest there, right? Uh, and so the bed in the Hebrew tradition symbolizes the home or the house, right? There's an element of home, security, protection, right? Home, house, hospitality, right? Now notice, in the Hebrew context, the home. In our context, this is how we draw home, okay? Watch this. And we have a fence, <laughs> right? We have a door, it's closed windows with drapes. This is a Western home, okay? It has a door which is closed, usually a fence. Look at the Hebrew home. Yes. So I feel like you could say also, so since Hebrew is read from right to left, so like you're in the home right now. Yes. But you're about to like go on this journey. You're going from okay. right to the left. And you're about to like yes, the home is supposed to open up onto the outside, right? Our homes don't. Our homes are very contained, right? We have even a fence, sometimes very small. My neighbor has one like that that's blocking out all the sun. So, right? So the Hebrew, however, concept of home, of self, right? Because that's the home, that's you. Concept of the home, concept of the self is one that is open. Yeah, part of it is closed, but part of it, it's always opening onto otherness. Bereshi, bit. The home which opens onto otherness. In the beginning was the home which opens onto otherness, right? So they say that Hebrew mystics say that the first letter, it encapsulates the whole Bible, right? The first letter of the Bible is bit. And they say, this is telling us from the start, right? Everything the Bible will be about, which is basically the you moving outside of yourself. And if you read the Hebrew Bible, this is the consistent message move out of yourself, move out of yourself towards the other, move out of yourself towards God, move out of yourselves towards social justice, move out of yourselves towards um, ethics, right? So this is really the bet. It would, because it's the first letter, it, it is supposed to contain the whole text. And the sages say, you see, the bet is the symbol of hospitality, of, of coming from myself to the other, Therefore, the whole Bible is a symbol of hospitality. Are you getting the, this is poetry, right? This is the mystics, they kind of, they play with these different ideas, but it's very profound truth. Everybody understood what I'm saying? This is not Cartesian. <laughs> it's not a clear and distinct idea like Descartes would like us to have. Okay, so it's interesting because if you start reading further in the creation story, and I would really encourage you to read because it's a very, very profound text, um, you have the emergence of the human couple. And it's so interesting because we, we are taught usually that God creates man first and then he, out of the man, he takes the woman. This is not how the text is written. The text actually says God creates the human. And then as he takes out the woman, the man emerges. <laughs> okay, this is very interesting. We know this from the Hebrew when the man eh, sees the woman. <laughs> he says, oh, here is woman 
for she was taken from man. And this is the first time we, we have two different words. We have the word for woman, the word for man. We don't have the, let me give you the vocabulary. So you can follow it. This book is very interesting. It tells us a lot already, just this story about this relationality. In the in first, you have the first human is called Adam. This is, doesn't mean man, it means earthly. Adam means ground. So Adam simply means the one made of clay, right? When he splits them, Adam says, Ish, because there is an Isha. Isha is woman, and Ish is man, right? So when he splits them, he says, oh, she will be called Isha because she was taken from man, Ish. This is the first time we see the word man, masculine, right? And so we, so, so it's not that there was a first a man and then there was a woman. If there was first a kind of being, <laughs> non-gendered being, right, who when Eve is created, emerges as a man, right? So this tells us very interesting. What does it tell us about when does man become conscious of himself as a man in this text? What makes him conscious that he's a man? Yes. What, what? No, no. <laughs> Before, right here. Oh, uh, <laughs> yes. Like, yes, exactly. As soon as he sees the woman, he's like, oh, I'm a man. He didn't know that before. He thought he was one of the animals. By the way, he's trying to be friends with the animals in a very intimate way, which is very problematic. Trying to make really forge alliances with the animals before he meets the woman. When he meets the woman, he's like, oh, that's who I am. Do you see how in this text immediately we know, again, this notion of relationality. I cannot be myself if you haven't crossed my path. The fact that you emerge in my life, I now know who I am. This is what the text is saying, right? You cannot know yourself, you cannot become aware and conscious of your own manhood if you haven't been in the presence of a woman and vice versa. And the general idea, of course, is you cannot know who you are until you have crossed paths with another person. <coughs> Why we don't need to see this on a gender level. The, the, the idea here is that I cannot know who I am until another being has crossed my path and reflected something to me as to who I am. Does that make sense? So again, this notion of relationality in the beginning is the relation. In the beginning, number one, Bereshit, Bet, hospitality, moving outside. Then you have the creation of the man uh, and the woman. And Bonnet, you had a question? Yeah, I'm just not familiar with the text. I don't know what it's like that. What about like, like animals? Like, they have a human. Like, what does it have? Um, I don't know if there's any. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, if I remember, wait, is there? Who knows the text really well? Male and female. In, in Genesis 1, okay, the animals are mentioned, the creation of the animals. There's two creation texts. The first one is, um, the animals are mentioned. Um, I forget if they're mentioned male and female, though. Anybody remember if the gender of the animals is mentioned in Genesis 1? Somebody check for me <laughs> while I'm talking. Uh, so are you checking by Zilbel? OK, we'll check. In the, second, the story here, the second creation where we're focusing on the human couple, the animals are not mentioned as male or female. Interesting. Wait, because he notices they have partners. Yeah, that's a good question, because obviously the animals are aware but not yet the man, <laughs> until he sees his vis-a-vis, -vis, right? So, I don't, uh, is, it, does that kind of clarify your question? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, that's a good question, because was gender already existing? And, and, and he could have, but he actually does, you do not see him even speak <laughs> until that woman comes across his path, right? And then he sees her and he's like, oh, I am fish, I am man, not just Adam, right? But we can check, the, I think Vaisabel is doing the checking. Second, second interesting, this is very uh, common in the Hebrew Bible. Um, this is after they eat the apple, if you're familiar with the story that the human couple, you know, they're forbidden to eat from one particular tree and the woman still, you know, she goes and she gets that fruit and then she gives it to her husband and then it's the end of the world. Basically, they're kicked out of the garden. Uh, and then it's interesting, Adam turns to his wife and he names her, specific name. And it's interesting, the name he gives her, if you know the story, it's very poignant because she is the one who took the fruit, right? She's the one who created the beginning of the end, right? She's the one that brought turmoil into the creation. 
and she's the one in a way who brought death into the world, right? And commentators, you know, go on and on about that. <laughs> right? Medieval commentators don't stop. They will never forgive us, right, for taking that fruit. But then look what Adam does. Look how he names her. Anybody remember what he names her? This is some of you guys should know these texts. They're foundational texts. You know, what does he name her? Yeah. Father. Yeah, what does it mean? I don't know exactly. He says what it means, yeah. Oh, I was going to say he. Yes, 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 and it means something in Hebrew. He himself, it defines it. Yes. The mother of the living. Mother of the living. She has just brought death into the world, and he's like, no, you're going to be mother of the living. He changes her destiny through the naming. So those of us, the feminists, you know, who read this passage, like, ew, he's naming us. How dare he name us? Actually, he's, this is a powerful act of redemption, right? Whereby he's saying, I'm shifting the course of your destiny right now. And I'm giving you this new destiny. The naming, you don't get a name by yourself in the Hebrew Bible. Someone gives you a name, whether it's God or your parents. But in general, the naming is basically saying your destiny has been given to you by someone else. You don't make yourself in the Hebrew Bible. It's always God or here the man who is giving you your name, your identity. So, and, and those of the feminists who are angry that Adam is giving name to Eve. This is so common in the Hebrew Bible, people giving names to people, male giving to female, female giving to male, God giving to so-and-so, right? Because this is the rampant idea throughout the Hebrew Bible that my name, meaning my destiny, is always given to me. I don't make myself. It's another human being who comes across and sees me and names me, right? And, and gets, So again, the same idea, right? This is, if you read the Hebrew Bible, this is one of the most profound ideas is that we are relational beings. And we will see the same powerful idea in African philosophy, interestingly. There are a lot of connections between the Hebrew Bible and the African worldview, probably because it's the same close geographical location, right? In fact, um, I remember my, my father teaches the uh, Hebrew and, and, and um, Hebrew Bible, and he, he sometimes uh, teaches overseas. And he, he used to tell me, when I go to the African countries, they get it. They really get the text in a way that the Europeans don't because it's the same culture, right? It's a very similar culture. The Near Eastern and the African culture are very similar. So we will see a lot of uh, connections between Huber, Levinas, who are Jewish thinkers and rooted in the Hebrew Bible and the African thinkers we're going to study next. We will see enormous connections, vivid connections, right? And one of these main connections is that the human being is not a rational animal, which is what the Westerners say. The human being is a relational animal. What makes us higher, what makes our dignity, what makes our prestige is not our brain and our ability to make technology, it's our ability to relate in a profound way. That's what makes our prestige. This is uh, completely different than the West, which says what makes our prestige is our brain and our ability to dominate nature and our ability to come up with technology and science. That's what they say distinguishes us from the lower realms, right? the lower species. But the Hebrews are saying, no, you can be a brute and be high in technology. I mean, just look at, just to give a low blow to Germany right now, um, <laughs> right? Germany, <laughs> just do this, let's go there. Um, at the time of World War II, was one of the most progressive nations in Europe. It was the progressive nation of Europe. It was the, the, the star of Europe. They were better than everybody else in science, in technology, in literature, not even just science, humanities, literature, philosophy, music, all Germans, religion with the Reformation. They were the top. And yet this is what happened, right? So he's saying civilization, culture, science, this is not what makes us superior. This is not what makes us elevated. It's the ability to relate. And so you can be in a country which is technologically inferior to another country, but if your relationships are more developed, you are actually on a superior level. This will be the argument of Leopold Senghor when we study him, right, in, in the African philosophy course, where he say, we are always seen as underdeveloped, but because we are seen based on these criteria of technology, if we were looked at through the lens of relationality, we would beat your ass. <laughs> we would be way ahead of you, right? So this is kind of the point he's going to make, that we have to, dis we have to look at the criteria that are used to distinguish the superiority or inferiority of nations. And if we look at the relational criteria, the West is way, West is underdeveloped, <laughs> right? West is not even, right? 
Uh, it's fourth world, right? So, so it's interesting. So, so here we really see the notion that what makes, make sure you write this down, that what makes us really elevated as beings in this world is not r rational, rationality, which is what the West teaches us, right? Oh, in as much as we are a technological, scientific country, we are superior. No, that's not what makes you superior, right? We know this from Germany who was superior in that way and end up being inferior and in, terribly, completely primitive when it came to, to the relational aspect. So what makes us superior, and if we want to talk like that, is not our rationality, it's our relationality. Our capacity to relate is what really shows the difference between uh, elevated being and lower forms of being. Um, so that's the first thing, right? These are, so when he's saying in the beginning is the relation, it's so laden, right? I hope you see everything that was in his mind as he was writing this, right? He was thinking of Bereshit, he was thinking of Bet, he was thinking of the creation of man and woman, the naming of the woman. All of this was floating, most certainly in Huber's mind. Now you have entered his mind a little bit and you see what is behind that very simple, humble sentence, right? Okay. So let's move on. He then goes on, and this is not, I'm not going to spend too much time on that. He goes on to talk about, and it's interesting that Augustine Shati will make the same case. He goes on to say, you know, uh, we see this in uh, uh, languages of, for example, the Zulu culture, right, of, of these ancient tribes, right? He talks about how in, in ancient tribal language, you can already see how they were already profoundly relational. For example, in, in the Zulu, instead of saying, I don't know if you saw that, instead of saying far away, they say, the place where one cries, mother, I am lost. I don't know if you saw this passage, right? So instead of saying far away, they say that whole sentence. I am, not far away, I am in the place where, I, where one cries and mother, I am lost, right? So it's a complete relational perspective. Far away, we look spatial, right? I'm here in this continent, they're there on that continent. In the Zulu language, it's like, Far away is like, I am cut off from my relationships. That's what far away means. <laughs> it doesn't mean I'm in this continent. And there. But so you can see already that how those ancient languages were already deeply relational, like Hebrew, right? This is also a very ancient language. And then, of course, he goes into child development. And I'm not going to go too deep into that because Augustine Shati will have a whole <laughs> chapter on that, right? How development occurs in relation and not by oneself, right? So now what I want to do is go to page 55 and dig into this IU uh, relationship that I mentioned last time because that's the foundation of everything we we're going to talk about for the next couple of weeks. Um, so remember, let's review that, right? Remember, for Buber, there are three relationships, <laughs> three types of relationships. I-I, which is basically a, a kind of narcissistic, solipsistic approach, right, where there is only you, <laughs> you with you. Right, um, which I don't think we'll deal with too much. Then there's the I it, where everything around you is an it. This is the Kantian, right? Means end, right? Everything is a means to an end. So you're in the kind of um, very low moral level there. And then says, uh, and, but Kant, of course, doesn't go, he says a few things about, um, you know, not treating someone as a means, but he doesn't talk about how to treat someone. You see what I mean? So Kant leaves us a bit hanging. He says, here's how not to treat someone so that you can reveal their good, right? Them as the good that is um, in them. Um, but then he doesn't say anything about how we can positively treat someone. And that's where Buber is going to complete the story, right? He's going to look at way beyond Kant. He's going to let's explore now this deeper way of relating the IU, which a lot of us, in fact, are might never even have experienced. We're so used to having people like it. Again, I mentioned, right, I'm just, um, <laughs> I'm just so in intrigued by the dating scene and um, um, the way that, I mean, I've talked to some people, God forbid I ever go there myself, but I've talked to some people who are on dating apps, right? And so the, the idea is you, you're dating, I mean, first of all, just the, the swiping, I mean, that is <laughs> shocking, right? It's like a, a um, what do you call it, a catalog, <laughs> you're going through a catalog. Ooh, this one, I'll buy that one. Not that one, not that one, this one. Already we are in a catalog mentality when it comes to dating, we are picking our product, right? Then we start texting, right? It's going well. And then what will happen often is we decide for ourselves that we don't want to be with that person. And what do we do then? We write them a long email, why? No, what do we do? 
Yeah. There's no way out. We will just go slow. We won't even explain. Many times on this dating, this treacherous waters that is the dating scene nowadays, you won't even explain to them anything. They will be like, I got ghosted. I don't know where this person is, right? Right? Or so this is, again, this is, we do this all the time, but Uber would be, or can't, especially would be horrified because we are, this is like an object. I use it a little bit. I'm sick of it. Let me just toss it out, right? So the ghosting, right? And then sometimes we use each other, right? We swiping, swiping. We think, ah, oh, I'm lonely. Let me get me a date tonight. Get a random person, see what happens, right? And then next, and we, we don't give a shit about them, right? But they're fun to be with for that night. And then, and then you know, the next day it's like, okay, man, let me move on to more serious things. And we ghost them. This is, this is the way. I mean, I know y'all don't usually do that. This is probably some, some other people you don't know, right? <laughs> but this is, we do this, right? And, and it, we, we take and then we discard. And just looking at the dating scene, you can see this. And this is everywhere. This is in the, uh, work world this is in the family this is in the school everywhere you have this notion i take for a little bit and then when i'm done i discard i take for a little bit when i'm done i discard and this is the this is most of our relationships as uber fall under that category and we need to develop or we should or be interested <laughs> in developing a deeper level of relating and that's what he's saying he's not saying we should he's saying we're missing out let me open up this dimension that's all he's doing right kant is not a moral philosopher He's a phenomenologist. He's not going to tell you, do this, don't do that. You're a jerk if you do that. He's going to say, look, here's where we are, most of us, in the I, it. Let me open up this deeper dimension for you, and then you decide if you want to go there or not. I don't care. <laughs> right? He's not a moral philosopher. He's a phenomenologist. He's there to open up dimensions of reality. So let's look at this deeper dimension of the I, you, and uh, let's see what does it mean to... Uh, address someone as a you. So I'm just going to look at one, actually. We're going to read page 55 at the top. Whoever, in the beginning, he sounds just like Kant, right? Whoever says you does not have something for his object, that's Kant. We don't have an it, right? He continues forever, there's something, blah, 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 blah. And then I get to this fascinating poetic line, the you has no borders. I want to talk about that a little bit. What does it mean to be with someone? So we know already, to be with a you is to not use them or discard them. This is Kant. We know that already. Now he goes deeper. The you, when you're with a you, that you should have no borders. In other words, do not put borders on that you. What does it mean to put borders on someone? Let's analyze this a little bit. And those who studied the text before, wait a little bit, <laughs> because I know you know. I think you studied it, right? Uh, did you? You were not in 104? Oh, you are in 104. Yeah. You were in 104? Yeah. Okay, so you're allowed to talk. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Let's start there. No, 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 no. Go ahead, Mackenzie. I think it's the opposite of the I do. Okay, so we have, that, uh, we have that just above, right? The U does not have something. But the U has no borders is different. It's, it, it's a different idea where you're saying, do not put a border on someone. What does that mean? How would that mean something else? Because we know that part already we shouldn't use, right? When he says the you does not have something for his object, that's clear allusion to Kant, don't use. We know that. But now there's something more going on. What does it mean to put a border on someone? So let's say that Goldstein and that Ramos and that Williams and you. Yes, okay, Williams, yes, go ahead. Is he saying that like by using people as an it in whatever way we're limiting them? and we're putting a border on their potential and like what they have and their good. Okay, you're on the right side. Don't drop the using. We saw that already. <laughs> See some, uh, just uh, don't say it. Uh, don't, don't even bring up the using. It's a different idea. Uh, say it differently. <laughs> um, looking at people as an it versus looking at them as a you could limit them. And what does it mean? How, can, how do we limit each other? This is a good question. How do we limit each other? sometimes through our gaze or our words. Uh, I'll say he's like trying to say like don't put expectations, don't have expectations. Like that's very good. Yes, that's number one, right? Number one, don't have in your mind who they should be and then telling them to be that. This is especially uh, when you're a parent or when you're in a romantic relationship. These are the two moments where we start to go crazy with <laughs> whoever we're with, right? The child has to be 
a doctor. Right? It cannot be any, no, you cannot be an artist. Right? Or the beloved, no, 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 you have to earn this amount of money. What are you doing? Right? Or you have to wear this. Right? So we are full of expectations, especially in deep, intimate relationships, because our ego is very much involved and we want the other person to make us proud. Right? So we will do this. We will we will what's the word imprison them in expectations and thereby we are limiting who they could be especially parenting and romantic relationships we cannot allow that person to be something else because we need them to be this so we can feel good <laughs> you see what i'm saying very often the parents will say you have to be this so i can feel like i've accomplished something <laughs> right if you're gonna be that that doesn't make me look good right same thing with romantic partnerships like wait a second you can't go and do this because you're supposed to be the wife. You can't go and do that because you're supposed to be the husband. So we have expectations, gender roles that we impose on each other. And we won't study that text, but there's a beautiful text on marriage here where he talks about, maybe we should study it, freeing up uh, or uh, opening up the marriage. And it doesn't mean by that that you go and you become swingers, right, <laughs> to open up the marriage. He's talking about we need to open up the marriage by seeing each other as you and not as it's. That's one way to open up the marriage is to say, okay, you're my husband, but you don't have to be fitting in the gender role of the husband. Yeah, you're my wife, but you don't have to fit in the gender role of a wife. You can be you, right? So we release them to be themselves. That's first thing that we do not create a board. So thank you. Very good. I hope you guys wrote this, right? First one, we create expectations, which means they have to be what we think they should be. And we're not allowing them. We're not giving them the oxygen or the space to be who they are. And this is especially true of parenting and, and also romantic relationships. We have a real hard time letting people be who they are, right? Uh, how else? How else do we put borders on each other? Uh, I think Ramos, you had something to say earlier. It's Don Rodriguez. Oh, when, when I put a border, it's like you feel like, yeah, like you're building a personality of a person. Okay, so making them, you have to be yeah, this. So like, yeah, exactly. yeah. Excellent, excellent. Yes, same thing, right? We make them into an image that we have in our minds. Yes. Can you be saying, like, don't be someone that's useful and, like, only like in a certain place? Like, if you have, like, a co worker, don't just, like, Using like the second you go out of work, like, you know, like, that's still in the using. You still, yeah, we're moving on. <laughs> New idea. Yes, that's good. I guess I see you get it. <laughs> but this is a different idea, right? Yes, that's true. Ah, yeah, very good, very good. This is the basis of racism, right? Oh, you're from that race, therefore. <laughs> I, I was gonna say something which I'm not. Um, <laughs> Sorry, it's funny, just for me. Okay, <laughs> it's when my dad is driving behind um, a woman. <laughs> and yes, all these assumptions. Uh, anyways, so I hope he doesn't see this video. But right, when we're driving, right, we have assumptions like the person is a woman, therefore, person is black, therefore, person is Asian, therefore. And you know, whether we like it or not, um, there's a there's African-American writer right now, philosopher called uh, Yancey, and he is making right now the very controversial claim to, to some that we are all racist, whether we like it or not. <laughs> We're all racist. Why? Because we are born in a racist culture and we have these, and, and I think he should, I don't know if, if he means just whites are racist or even blacks are racist with regards to themselves, right? But we are born in such a culture where racism is so omnipresent that we cannot help ourselves then grow up with racist notions, which we then have to fight against, right? So Buber in a way is saying, this is true. We sometimes really stereotype people based on race. And he mentions, of course, um, this is a typical one, right? Which maybe some of us experience. You're walking down the street. I know some guys have experienced this. You're walking down the street or, uh, and, and, and you're, you're, there's this woman ahead of you, right? So this is for the guys. Um, and then she sees you and you sense her clutching her purse a little more or shifting sidewalk, depending on what you're wearing as a guy. How many guys experience this? Like someone, yeah, this is great, <laughs> right? So this is just an example, right, of, of um, the way that some, all of us in a way have internalized this fear of the other based on, oh, they're that color, they're dressed like this. This is what got what's his face killed, right? Trayvon Martin was wearing a hoodie. 
And so assumption, hoodie, oh, therefore, you know, shady, blah, blah, blah. No, I won't kill this guy, right? So this is all these assumptions we have with regards to certain color of skin, with the way certain people dress, or with, um, with the gender and so forth. We, it's floating in our heads. And Buber is saying uh, he would agree with George Yancey, right? Who says that we are all racist no matter what we think. He would agree that we need to constantly fight against those notions in order to liberate the you and the person in front of you, right? Yeah, there is the Asian and then, <laughs> right? Maybe there is much more there than just the stereotype you have in your mind. So any type of stereotyping, any type of uh, sexism or racism is missing the you of the other person. The, 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 the main problem of racism is that it's missing the you, right? It's, it's seeing someone as an it, color, therefore that, and therefore clutching my purse, <laughs> right? Um, so that's the idea here. And that's a very good uh, uh, other point, very good. How is another way that we create walls around someone or borders around someone? There's one more way, which you might not get right away. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. <laughs> you want to try? Okay, yeah, that's related to the first one, right? Give them room to grow as who they are, right? Give them room to grow not as what you want to impose. Give them room. And sometimes, you know, I, let me go, let me take yours as a different idea. Giving them time is one way that we can, right? Sometimes in a relationship, whether it's a child or whether it's um, a parent or a romantic partner, we get impatient. You need to change now because <laughs> we had this conversation yesterday and why aren't you different today, right? We don't realize that people need time to, you know, grow, transform, evolve. And so when we immediately shackle them in our expectations of now, we are missing the you, right? The you allows the space and the time for somebody to change or grow in a direction which might not even be what we want, <laughs> right? This is really, by the way, this is the least stressful way to live. I know because I'm really good at putting little shackles on people. <laughs> this is my specialty, right? So, and it's so stressful because they don't fit. And you're like, Argh! every day you're trying to squeeze them into this and they don't let you do that. And they're always overflowing in complete chaos. And it's exhausting, let me tell you, from experience. So when you finally let go and you're like, you know, be you. Oh, now I can relax. I don't have to squeeze you into anything anymore. I can relax, let you be you. I'm there if you need me. You know, if you need anything, I'm going to love you, accept you. And I can see then the person growing naturally. They don't need me always there clipping away at everything, right? So th this is very relaxing to do this, actually. I would really, uh, I suggest it. <laughs> whether you're parenting or whether you're in a romantic relationship, releasing the other releases you. <laughs> Let me say that again. This is a good one. Releasing the other releases you. Freeing the other frees you. Because we'll see with Boover, it's reciprocal. I become you as you, as I know you. We'll see, there's a sentence like that. I'm gonna look at it in a second. Oh yeah, here it is. I require a you to become, becoming I, I say you go look at that. But right, we are connected. So when I release you, I'm releasing myself in a way. And so this is also, I'm recovering my you, <laughs> right? When I release your you, very good. So I think you're getting the idea, right? And you can see how this is not necessarily natural. It's hard to do because we are so used to being on the I it level that actually it becomes hard to do the I you. But when we really do it, it's really freeing. You can breathe because you're letting them breathe, right? So, um, so that's really a different way of, of functioning than we're used to. We want to control everything. And this is really letting go of control, relinquishing control over the other person. And by doing so, we free ourselves, right? And so that's the invitation that Uber is, is giving us. Um, let's look at the last one here on page 62, uh, the last quote. That's interesting. Um, what was the assignment? 287? Oh, yeah, there's some really nice ones. Let's look at this first paragraph of 62. Look at this one. The you encounters me by grace. It cannot be found by seeking. What is he saying? What is the meaning here? What is another facet here that we're discovering with regards to the IU relationship? That it encounters me by grace. You cannot seek it. It's like experiences or things that come to you. 
Exactly. As soon as you start to go after something, you are creating an I it relationship, right? The, 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 most, the deepest relationships in your lives will hit you from the outside. The deepest friendships, the deepest romantic partnerships. You cannot make happen friendship. You cannot make happen love. You cannot even make happen a connection to God. It has to come to you. You have to just be open. Right. And that's what we're learning here is one of the other aspects of the you is that I cannot lure them. I cannot attract them. I cannot make them do X, Y, and Z. They have to come in their own terms. I just have to be open to them. Right. All these uh, books that you read about how to get a man in five days or how to seduce a woman in 10 days, you know, these books, right? This is all I eat. <laughs> just so you know, <laughs> right. It's good to, I mean, it's interesting. I love these books, by the way, because I'm a control freak, so I've read all of them. Um, but, you know, <laughs> noticing, um, I'm, I've noticed that they work only to a certain degree. At one point, the other person will shake off that yoke, <laughs> right, and, and, and get away, right? So there's only a certain, we, we, we are not approaching relationships in the correct way when we are approaching how to get, how to seduce, how to, you know, we, we, this is I it level still, right? And Buber would warn us against trying to learn the art of, there's a great book out there for men. Uh, Y'all can look at it if you want. It's The Art of Seduction by, anybody know this book? The Art of it's a big deal. Everybody reads it on the bus. Um, and it is, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I read a, a little bit of it and I was, my, my Buberian sensitivities were horrified. It was like, it was just straight up, you know, how to get in their head, um, here's one. Here's a good one. Um, you can use this if you want. So you're dating someone, right? And um, one way to get them attached to you forever, I'll tell you right now, is uh, make sure you find where is the trauma. So for example, their parents used to criticize them a lot and stuff. And make sure you act exactly the opposite. And that way they will have found like, oh, that person loves me right, for who I am. And like, you don't even mean it, right? You think they're a jerk. I mean, you think they're, you agree with the parents. <laughs> they're a complete loser on that level. But here you are hypocritically telling them, oh, but you're, so, and in this way, right? This is, this is what some of the stuff that are in that book, right? I mean, it works to a certain level, but eventually the person will snap out of your, <laughs> control but uh, what we need to understand is that yes it works but it is still on the level of the I it where you're still trying to get you're still trying to make happen and you are still on a certain level to get to the deeper level of the I you at one point you have to just let go and be receptive what comes your way what doesn't what comes and goes right you can you know obviously be out there don't stay home you know watching tv and what are you potato chips right you want to be out there open but you cannot force these things right that's what we're learning here same with parenting right some parents trying to control their kids make them into um barbie dolls and kens right perfect um, it, what, what, I, I pity them, right? It, when the child turns 13, it's gonna be, <laughs> it's gonna be a show. <laughs> it's gonna be a show. I have a friend, uh, hopefully she'll never see this video, but she'll recognize herself right away. So she had a baby, right? And she had like this structure when she would feed it, like she had it down. Like she, that baby was scripted. He was like, you can't. They made it so he would cry only certain hours. Like, I, I wanna learn this. I think it's delicious. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think it's great, but I am waiting for that baby when they turn 13 because she's doing this when she's, you know, breastfeeding and then she'll continue doing versions of this until the baby is 13 and then the baby will explode. I can predict you that, right? So we cannot, right? Even with children, we think we have authority, right? Well, until they're 12 because they're, you know, children are pushed over until they're 12 and then watch watch what happens, all the repressed emotions, right? So we cannot do this. We cannot uh, control or strive or mold, the thing has to be a spontaneous, organic, come, come to us, right? Rather than, so that's, um, I, I really like that quote a lot. Here's the last one that I love. This one, I want you to memorize because when we do Augustine Shati and Leopold Senghor, the African guys, this will come, this should come back in your mind. Last sentence of that paragraph. I require a you to become. I require a you to become. What, what, what does this mean? Very important. <laughs> yes, Rama, I feel you know. <laughs> uh, it's like how Adam needed the woman. Yes. Very good. Then, so we kind of refer to 
journey to realize it. Exactly. Right? I require a you. In other words, I need to be an I'm I you relationship to become a true I. If I'm only an I it relationship, I don't become a true I. I become a stunted, li limited version of who I am. But only when I am engaging with a you, when I'm learning to cultivate I you relationships in my life, do I truly rise to the level of my I. And then, same thing, becoming I, I say you. In other words, as I become a higher I, I'm better able to say you to you. So it's reciprocal. The you can make me a better I and my better I can make you a you. It is what, notice the reciprocity. We will see this very, very vividly in the African philosophy where the self is and the other are constantly influencing each other um, and, and building each other up, right? So this is very, I, I want you to remember that sentence when we get to it. Okay. Let's conclude here. Next time we're going to do a little more. We'll do some business ethics next time. Oh joy! And uh, <laughs> uh, and then yeah, and then we'll finish with um, I think the spiritual connection. So uh, workshop today, if you want, I'm going to be in the hallway on the two chairs, uh, just right there, you know, just around the corner because I'm getting kicked out. I think uh, by the next teacher. Um, so I'll see whoever needs to stay. Please stay. Um, the most of you possible, so we can get this uh, fixed. All right, turn this off.